Access to democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. The division championship Minnesota Twins are looking to go all the way to the World Series in 2024. Bolstered by inspirational shortstop Carlos Correa, a healthy Brian Buxton, and rookie phenom Royce Lewis, plus a pitching staff led by Pablo Lopez and an outstanding bullpen featuring Johan Duran, the Twins are the best bargain in the major leagues, and Target Field is the best venue in baseball. Sheridan Dulas and Kins, PA, a family and criminal defense law firm, has been serving clients in Dakota County and throughout Minnesota for over 40 years. Ranked a tier one best law firm by US News and World Report every year since 2009, Sheridan Dulas and Kins are here to help you in your most difficult life circumstances. Established in 2007, 45th Parallel Spirits was among the first 50 micro distilleries in the United States. Based in New Richmond, Wisconsin, all aspects of production occur at our facility. If you're interested in visiting and learning more about the 45th Parallel Distillery, please check our website and plan a visit to tour our facility and taste our spirits. Truestone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. Truestone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. Truestone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Hello, welcome to Access to Democracy. I'm your host, Steve Francisco. It's a real pleasure to welcome to our studio this afternoon a return visitor to Access to Democracy. The last time Lori Halverson appeared on our program, she was serving in the Minnesota legislature. But for the past several years, she has a new job. She is uh, still relatively new, the Dakota County Board of Commissioners. Welcome Lori Halverson to Access to Democracy. Thank you so much for having me. So you represent District 3 mm -hmm. of the Dakota County Board of Commissioners. Tell our viewers what cities or towns are included in District 3. Yeah, well, you can take a look at the map, and it's really the north part of, of the um, county, um, including the cities of Lilydale, Mendota, Mendota Heights, Sunfish Lake, and a large part of Egan. Do the boundaries for county commissioner districts, do they change very often? Is it once every 10 years, like legislative districts? Yep, just like the legislative districts, our districts change based on shifts in population. And it actually was interesting because I was elected to a four-year term in 2020. And uh, in 2022, they redrew the boundaries, which meant I had to run for re-election halfway through my term. And so um, I have run and won twice <laughs> in this uh, new district. Interesting. So. Mm -hmm. Do the district boundaries t tend to change very much or geographically are they fairly consistent, would you say? We work hard to try to um, <clears throat> keep, uh, and, and the county board ultimately votes on what is proposed, but values around keeping um, communities together, um, mm -hmm. keeping um, you know the lines contiguous, um, and making sure that we have a good uh, uh, geographic and demographic um, coverage in our, in our districts all, all play into those mm -hmm. conversations. So Lori, you mentioned you were first elected to the county board 2020 and mm -hmm. you took office in 2021. What committees do you serve on on the county board? Mm -hmm. Well, the county board itself um, has a, a small number of uh, committees of the whole, and so I actually get to chair the Community Services Committee, which has uh, oversight and responsibility over all of the, the services we provide from mental health to um, child wellness, public health, um, and uh, the list goes on. Um, and then uh, all of us also serve on um, the public develop, or excuse me, physical development uh, committee as well as general government. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where we talk about good nerdy policy. Community services would seem to be a particularly good fit for you given your previous experience in the Minnesota House of Representatives representing Egan. Well, it, it is, and it's actually one of the reasons <laughs> I wanted to run for county board um, because uh, 
the, the state and the county are really partners in delivering services. And the state sets up money, um, sets up direction to counties, but counties really carry out the services. And so doing that hands-on work and being on the ground really was important to me. And uh, it's, it's exciting to see, you know, the things that happen. Uh, mm -hmm. We've built um, a shelter for teens in Dakota County since I've been on the board. We are building a mental health crisis center um, in Dakota County since I've been on the board. And so, um, and then uh, increasing the number of social workers that we have working in our communities, embedding social workers into uh, police departments. All of those things um, really are boots on the ground work that I get to be a part of every single day. So. Because of your committee assignment, your chairmanship of that particular committee. So I'm curious, uh, you did serve in the Minnesota legislature representing Egan four terms, was it? Correct. So I'm curious, how did your service in the legislature perhaps prepare you or better prepare you to serve in county government? What lessons did you learn from the legislature that carry over to your current work? Well, certainly the policy. I served on Health and Human Services um, Finance for all eight years I was in the legislature. I served in the Commerce Committee and I served on the um, State Government Finance Committee and Elections. So all of those um, responsibilities really are carried out in big ways by counties. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I understand the, the policy quite well, uh, built relationships, but also um, understanding the, the important roles that counties play. That's something I learned a lot about in the legislature, that uh, counties are just vitally important to the way that our communities uh, function, the way that our communities are healthy, the way that our communities are safe. Um, it's, it's a level of government people don't necessarily know very well, mm -hmm. but it's vitally important. And we live in a state that has 87 counties, right? Correct. So there are 87 different county boards all over the state of Minnesota. Yes. Kind of an important part of government that we should have a better understanding of. Mm -hmm. yeah. And county boards actually work together as well, which a lot of people probably don't know, but there is an association of Minnesota counties and mm -hmm. we get to know each other from around the state and share ideas and uh, share knowledge and uh, create partnerships. And Lori, would it be fair to say that even though you have those partnerships and relationships with other counties, the concerns, public policy concerns, or issues that you may be dealing with in a suburban metro area such as Dakota County may be quite different than a more rural county in far northwestern Minnesota. Would that be fair to say? You know, I think that there are similarities and differences. Mm -hmm. I, I often look at Dakota County as a microcosm of Minnesota because we do have very rural areas of our state. We do have heavily agricultural areas. The southern uh, part of, of our, Dakota County. Our, our right. um, county. And then we have um, some of the fastest growing communities uh, in the state and uh, in, you know Lakeville yep. passed up Egan as the the largest uh, city in Dakota County um, and uh, Rosemont Apple Valley are, are growing quickly so um, we kind of have it all here which I think makes it interesting for policy so to give our viewers uh, perhaps a clear picture of just what it is the county government does and um, how big is the county's budget mm -hmm. and uh, where does Dakota County get its money from yeah those are really good questions. Um, and we are, again, very close to uh, our constituents because the, the bulk of the revenue that Dakota County gets is from levy dollars. It's about a third of our budget comes from the levy. Overall, we um, have- That's a property tax Property levy. taxes, right. yes. Um, that said, um, Dakota County does uh, really work hard to have a judicious uh, approach to property taxes and it's, made us one of the lowest taxed um, uh, proper, or, um, counties in the state. And mm -hmm. so it's important, I think, for people to know that uh, even though that revenue comes from your property taxes, it's spent very wisely. Value is very important, I think, to all of us on the county board. Um, but overall, we manage a budget of over uh, you know, $518 million. Mm. That probably makes people very, very surprised. Um, but it, it wouldn't half be- Half a billion dollars. Half a billion dollars. Um, a large portion <coughs> of that actually um, goes to capital improvement projects. Mm -hmm. So taking care of, you know, the, the capital that, that we manage and counties own a lot of land and a lot of buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and you can look to our parks, you can look to our libraries, um, you know, public spaces where people um, gather and then places where people get services. I, I talked about 
um, you know, our youth shelter, um, places where people are getting mental health services. We also manage all of that property. And then you look at the operating size of, uh, side of our budget, which is uh, $336 million. Mm. And, um, you know, that is, the, and about half of that goes to community services work. So caring for people with disabilities, um, making sure that we have uh, mental health supports. Uh, we have a robust program to uh, make sure that kids are meeting developmental milestone and birth to eight years. Um, we run one of the best public health programs in the country. We've been awarded um, by our uh, uh, national county um, peers to have one of the best public health program, uh, uh, departments in the, in the country. So very we're very good. proud of that. Lori, do I have this right? My understanding, Dakota County is the third most populous county in the state of Minnesota after Hennepin and Ramsey counties. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, so, we are. And we have, what, approximately 440 some thousand residents in yeah. Dakota County. Just Many of that. them concentrated in the more suburban areas such as Apple Valley, Egan, Burnsville, Lakeville. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and we continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And I was curious what you said earlier about holding the line on property tax increases, uh, doing the best you can to make sure that dollars are spent wisely because my impression is that property values in Dakota County continue to increase too. Uh, we definitely have um, a lot of value in our property in Dakota County. Um, the, I would say, you know, the bulk of that is in um, individual, um, you know, family homes, mm -hmm. but we also have a pretty large swath of agricultural property and business property. Um, that is, is managed in Dakota County and all of those um, entities contribute to local property taxes. Mm -hmm. But the county also receives state dollars because we are a partner with the state and they say, here's some money, right. go do this. Um, is that uh, money designated for things like yes. roads or highways and yeah. things? That tends to be designated money or they don't just give you money and say, spend as you wish. It's interesting you say that. So um, much of the money is encumbered. About 80% of our budget is spent on things that the state is mandating that we do. Mm -hmm. um, some of those things are paid for, some of those aren't. And, and that's where um, we balance the budget with grants, levy dollars, other things, um, federal dollars as well. Um, but uh, in the last legislative session, okay. the legislature really um, gave counties uh, a, a real benefit of saying, we believe in the work that you do, we believe in providing you flexibility, and they increased county program aid for the first time in many years significantly. And those are unencumbered dollars. Was that partly because the state of Minnesota was running a record projected surplus and so they had more money that they could do that? It, it was, and the other thing is, is it was really an acknowledgement of the fact that county program aid, um, as well as uh, city program aid, had shrunk so much mm. in um, in in the past, uh, you know, few decades with regard to um, what it could actually buy in, for counties, and that put much more pressure on local property Interesting. taxes. Interesting. And so um, this is, you know, when you talk about county program aid and dollars coming to the county from the state. Um, we look at that as uh, tax, um, tax relief and right. making sure that we have, and what we're being told to do is being paid for by the state. So how many county commissioners are there in Dakota County and how closely do you work with each other? Well, What's that working relationship with, with your colleagues on the board? Well, we have seven county commissioners. Um, all counties in Minnesota have seven or um, five commissioners. So if you're over a certain population, um, you have the option to be a seven member board and we are. So there's seven geographic districts that are represented. Um, but I would say that we don't necessarily look at a lens exclusively from geographic districts. We really, um, every single one of the county board members kind of approaches their job as a countywide job. And- um, An at large perspective, yes, if you will. Yes. Yeah. Um, we do operate under um, open meeting laws and so um, we're not having coffee clutches, you know, together. Um, the, the conversations that we have about policies, you know, happen in public meetings. And um, so I hope you get a flavor of kind of um, what the different priorities are and the way that we come together in making decisions. Because right. ultimately, um, if we, sometimes we all agree on something, other, other times we've got different approaches and different priorities and, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to work through that. But 
Um, the good news is, is that we do. And I think that it, it serves the people of, of the county well. And we've got one of the most um, experienced boards, I would say, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, three of us have experience in the legislature. Um, a number of the board members have experience in local government, local as, you know, lo as uh, city council members or local mayors mm -hmm. um, or serving on uh, co uh, city commissions. And so there's many years of experience among this county board and I think it shows. That's really an important point because when you have a board with that kind of collective experience, it helps you do your work, helps you be more efficient in how you do the county's work too, doesn't it? It definitely does, and I think that um, it also means that you've got seven people who are really experienced at um, negotiating, at mm -hmm. getting to know how issues work, and um, finding solutions. Mm -hmm. How closely does the county board work with our legislative delegation? We work very closely with our legislative delegation. I was at the, the Capitol for a few hours yesterday um, testifying on some bills um, that our legislative delegation is carrying on behalf of Dakota County. And um, we're on the phone regularly with them during the legislative session and outside of that to develop um, policies. So particular, one of the particular concerns that you have had a career interest in, I think it's fair to say, healthcare and particularly mental health care. What is Dakota County uh, doing with respect to making sure that residents have access to health care and health care services, mental health care services? Well, um, I think it's no secret that uh, mental health is, is a concern across the county for many, many families. And we're all touched by it in, in some way, um, the, the needs. And um, we have seen a real decrease in access to mental health services. Um, and so um, Dakota County has taken a bigger role in filling those gaps um, in services. Um, we've, as I said, we've hired um, many additional social workers so that we have um, people on, on staff who can provide services where they're needed and when they're needed. Um, we have an award-winning program of embedded social workers with our um, local law enforcement, which is a fantastic partnership where um, local law enforcement are getting uh, mental health calls that they weren't necessarily equipped to deal with. The mm -hmm. tools in their toolbox are very different than the tools in a social worker's toolbox. And so they have a social worker that they can bring along to calls or choose to send to calls instead of law enforcement when that would be a more appropriate response. And what it does is it, it diverts people from having to go down a, a criminal justice path to getting help to the health care path of getting help. And I've always said, let's, it, mental health is health care. Which let's is get them really, to when you think about it, that's the more appropriate place to go, isn't it? Yeah, and so we've diverted a thousand calls um, in the last two years um, from local law enforcement into our mental health crisis services. Seems, that that's, seems to me that's really a significant point because we've all heard stories in the news where there have been tragic encounters between people suffering mental health episodes and encountering law enforcement and you know not just to blanket criticize the police they have a tough job to do too but as you said they're not always well equipped or adequately trained to deal with those types of situations so having social workers and people embedded with law enforcement maybe leads to more appropriate outcomes and less risk for the public and I would say that the, the um, local law enforcement um, agencies have really been involved in building this program to uh, mm -hmm. address the needs that they have seen mm -hmm. and uh, really appreciate their partnership in building this program. And I was at the legislature yesterday asking for an additional appropriation so that we can continue the program. Um, there is a little gap in funding right now. And so um, call your legislators and let right. them know. Let them know. <laughs> I was interested to see um, uh, had come across an article some time ago that pointed out that Dakota County uh, had actually, during the COVID pandemic, one of the highest rates of vaccination, especially among our senior population mm -hmm. of any county in Minnesota, and actually one of the highest rates of vaccination of any county in Minnesota. How do you think that happened? Well, I, I know it happened through a, ver a lot of hard work and creativity um, and uh, we, uh, early on in the pandemic, when we were getting some state dollars um, and the state said, you are closest to the people, get out there and, and use these dollars creatively. Dakota County um, 
uh, purchased and, and equipped a mobile um, vaccination lab so that we could drive around to different communities. There was really important partnerships with underserved communities and communities of color, making sure that um, our uh, community health workers who are um, embedded in community have language skills, have cultural um, connections to communities um, were out there um, helping uh, create those bridges. And so uh, across all populations, we saw very high rates of vaccination and we're very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Very important. You have noted, uh, I believe on your campaign website previously, and maybe on your county board website as well, uh, you've talked about racial disparities, that there seem to be um, a significant list of disparities in Minnesota with respect to health care, adequate housing, job opportunities. So what are some of the things that Dakota County is doing to try to reduce or eliminate those racial disparities that we see? Yeah. Because of the impact that people that counties have on people's day-to-day -day lives, counties are really it's very important that counties are aware of racial disparities and um, disparities in outcomes based on race. Um, it's particularly true in health, but it's also true in terms of access to um, uh, education, access to um, job opportunities, and so. Um, it starts by knowing and understanding um, that, that particular issue. And so as a county, we've dug into uh, the demographics um, and uh, dug into uh, the, the data around where we're missing the boat in terms of uh, outcomes. Uh, I will say as proud as we are as Minnesotans of our state and the overall health of our state, um, the uh, uh, job uh, rates of our state, the ep economic uh, prosperity of our state, the fact is, is when you look at communities of color, we rate as some of the lo lowest um, in the state, in the, in the country around economic uh, disparities. So um, we're on par with states like Mississippi and, and uh, Alabama. And, uh, and so- uh, That's it is, not a place we wanna be. not a place we wanna be. But I think that for Minnesotans, the, the first job is to recognize it um, that that is a need and that it's very, very real. And, um, and then it is about uh, working with community and uh, diving down into what the root causes are. And we're uh, working on a project now to um, create what's called Family Resource Center, which are community-based creations mm -hmm. that the county comes in to support. And so we can provide county services. Very often the government isn't always the best first face that right. people see and community needs to be that first face. And so we're um, looking at getting some private grant dollars to begin building those um, family resource centers. Well, and, and luckily we live in a state with a significant number of nonprofit organizations that can help meet some of those needs too. Mm -hmm. And we do partner quite closely with nonprofits. The <laughs> county does. Yes. Yeah, very good. Um, I want to touch, if we could, for a moment on a problem that is a national problem, and certainly here in Dakota County too, the opioid and fentanyl crisis. Uh, uh, there may have been an impression on the part of some people that this was more of an urban only problem. That's not true, that this is a problem nationwide. <clears throat> here in Minnesota, it's occurring in suburban communities. Uh, it's occurring in rural areas of Minnesota as well across the state. So. How do you view this crisis and what are some of the things that county government can do to try to stem this problem, working with your partners at the state and federal level? That's a, that's a great question. And, and honestly, the, the, um, st our, the state of Minnesota was, was a state that um, was part of a lawsuit against the opioid manufacturers and the distributors. And so we have a settlement coming to us and there is a community um, board that has been put together by the county to um, work on uh, root causes and work on solutions. Um, some cities are doing some remarkable work. Um, South St. Paul, West St. Paul have built a partnership and are applying for state money um, to help uh, with their opioid response. This community of Hastings has been very, very proactive with their um, partners like the YMCA and getting education out there. Touches my mom heart because um, this is uh, an issue, this is a, a situation where we don't have room for error and uh, experimentation can, can be deadly. And uh, we know that um, addiction and uh, overdoses continue to rise and our goal is to uh, reduce or eliminate 
um, addiction and death in our communities from opioids. It's good to hear that we're part of the legal action against the opioid manufacturers. We had Skip Humphrey, the former Attorney General of Minnesota, was on our program last year, mm -hmm. and we recounted some of the history in the landmark tobacco settlement, which led to Minnesota and other states receiving you know, tens of millions of dollars that could be put toward education and treatment for people uh, addicted to nicotine products and also limitations on how those products were being marketed and manufactured. So maybe a similar path uh, we could look for with respect to opioids. We definitely um, at the Capitol took that approach, um, modeling it after the settlement with tobacco. Right. The other thing I will say about tobacco being a public health advocate is that um, they're back and we also are receiving a settlement from Juul um, for the way that they targeted um, youth uh, with vaping. Vaping, and right. So, um, Public health work is, is very broad and the county is the first line of defense right. for, for our communities. Lori, we're down to just a few minutes and uh, I wanna to touch if I could on what I think is one of the crown jewels of living in Dakota County, if I may put it that way, our county park system. My wife and I and many residents enjoy our county parks, particularly we live not far from Lebanon Hills. We love going on the nature trails and hiking trails in the park. And it's hard to believe that we're in the middle of a major metropolitan area. Once you're in the middle of Lebanon Hills, you feel like you're in northern Minnesota. Um, the county plays an important role in obviously maintaining those parks. And say a word, if you would, about how much in resources does the county put into maintaining our county park system? Um, it certainly is a major priority um, for Dakota County. And um, I, I can't give you an exact number of what we put into it, but it is a, a priority. It's something that we uh, work hard for at the legislature to get, the legislature to get state resources mm -hmm. for as well. Being connected is very important when it comes to our open and natural spaces. And um, those spaces are vital for everybody, where, whether you're in the northern part of the county and you're looking for uh, accessibility in Thompson County Park, or um, you're in the southern uh, part of the county and you're looking for the kind of natural resource preservation that means Ravine offers you, um, Dakota County works to offer it all, and then connecting, connecting it with really important um, greenway experiences. Right. And we can look forward in the next several years to the development of our Veterans Memorial Greenway, um, which will eventually connect to Lebanon Hills, but will also provide um, outdoor spaces and uh, places for reflection to honor the veterans that, that have served from Dakota County. Mm -hmm. We should uh, mention we're down to about two minutes here. Um, where can viewers go if they want to learn more about your work on the Dakota County Board and, and what county government is doing? Yes, well, certainly the Dakota County um, website is, is a great resource. Definitely recommend people check that out. You can find very detailed budget information. You can also find contact information for your county commissioners if you have a question or want to learn more. The county hosts many open houses. Anytime we're working on a policy or making change, connecting with the community is a really important way that we do that. So um, if there's an opportunity for you to come to an open house, come. Um, ask your questions, tell us your opinion. It's one of the best ways to connect with county government. And, um, and then, uh, like I said, we're part of your community as well. Don't hesitate to uh, reach out because um, those kind of conversations really continue to make us better policymakers. Really important. Lori Halverson, uh, Dakota County Commissioner, thank you for being our guest on Access to Democracy today and giving our viewers uh, perhaps a better understanding of just what it is county government does and how it affects uh, people's lives. Thank you for your work on the county board on behalf of the people of Dakota County too. Thanks for the conversation, this was great.